If you have your Bibles, why don't you take it, hold up it high up in the air with me and say this uh, Bible blessing after me. Say, this is my Bible, God's holy word. I am what it says I am. I will do what it says for me to do. I place myself under the authority of God's word. It says I am blessed. Therefore, I am blessed. It says I am healed. Therefore, I am healed. It says I'm an overcomer. Therefore, I overcome. Every obstacle, every challenge, every hindrance, through the name above every name, Jesus Christ. I open my heart to receive God's word. I receive this word. I confess this word in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're ready, I'm ready. Hey, now take that Bible and turn with me to John chapter 20. We're going to be looking today at the story of Jesus and a a man named Thomas. Often uh, Thomas gets a bad rap because uh, Thomas is known as doubting Thomas. So we're going to pick up in John chapter 20, verse 24. It says this, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, named the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand in the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were gathered together again. This time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe, my Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Can we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to come and to break uh, the bread of your word. Lord, we come to your table, God, on your terms. And Lord, today I pray, God, that as we gather together as a community of faith, that we will be changed by your word. God, our hearts, our minds are open to receive what you have for us. God, I pray today our lives be forever changed by being in your presence. And everybody said, amen. Amen. I want you to uh, imagine something with me. If I were to tell you to, to close your eyes and I was to say, hey, I want you to imagine what Jesus looked like, what would he look like to you? You know, sometimes I think uh, we paint a picture of who Jesus is that probably isn't always consistent with the word of God. In fact, as, as a culture, we're actually really obsessed trying to know what Jesus might have looked like. You know, I I don't know about you, but I do know this. Jesus probably did not look like me, you know, my color, uh, lack of hair on top of my head, a a lack of beard or something like that. And, And as a culture, we're obsessed with knowing, man, what did Jesus look like? It's a topic in recent years. And in fact, there's been like recent Uh, studies or recent history to kind of reconstruct what Jesus might look like. One of these ways was uh, through what's called the Shroud of Turin. And the Shroud of Turin, uh, history believes that this might have been the garment that Jesus was wrapped in between his crucifixion as he was placed into the tomb. And this garment is like 14 feet long when wrapped around the body. And in 2018, researchers in Italy, they did a rendering a 3D carbon copy of what Jesus' body or the, the man's body of, that this cloth would have been laid around. They formed this into a statue that actually was five feet by 10 inches, representing what Jesus might have looked like. 
Then you've got uh, archaeologists that have kind of tried to reconstruct a painting of maybe what Jesus would look like. And there's this guy, his name's Richard Neve, where he took three different skulls uh, from an Israeli archaeological site near where Jesus was believed to be born at the same time period he's believed to be born. And he used a computerized x-ray and ultrasound methods to try to create a model of what Jesus might look like. And so based on anthropological and genetic data, he came up with an image of what Jesus might have looked like. And as a society, we are like obsessed with what Jesus might have looked like, but I think we're asking the wrong question. I, I, I think the question actually comes from a place of error to begin with, that we ask a question like, what did Jesus look like, when instead we should be asking the question, what does Jesus look like? look like and we form ideas around who Jesus might be we paint pictures of him of who he used to look like while neglecting what scripture teaches us about what Jesus looks like today and I submit that we get an incredible description of what Jesus looks like right here in John chapter 20 I remind you that John 20, the passage that we're reading today, comes after Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus has already been resurrected from the dead. And now he spends about 40 days talking and communing with the disciples before he ascends to the Father. So Jesus is in his resurrected body right now. And I think we get a beautiful glimpse into what the face of Jesus and his body looks like if you're taking notes fill in the blank is this the face of Jesus is the face of the forever scarred God we see from John chapter 20 that Jesus comes to Thomas and he he shows him the scars in his hands he shows him the scar on his side and on his feet and in John 20, Jesus is appearing to Thomas and the disciples after his crucifixion, after the resurrection. He's in his glorified body. And notice this, that Jesus is in his glorified body and still bears the scars of his crucifixion. So when we say, what does Jesus look like today? Jesus today still bears the scars of the crucifixion 2,000 years ago. The face of Jesus is one that bears the scars of his beating and his whipping. Because Jesus is the God that bears the scars of humanity forever. And in our, in our pursuit of trying to understand what Jesus of Nazareth might have looked like, we neglect and we forget that the face of Jesus is the face of the forever scarred God. We sing songs like, God, show me your face. I want to see your face, Jesus. But the face that is looking at us is the face of the one that bears the scars of the crucifixion. I want to title my thoughts this morning, The Forever Scarred God. Thomas Aquinas, 500 years ago, he wrote this. It is evident that the scars with Christ showed on his body after his resurrection have never since been removed from his body. So what does it mean that Jesus, our Savior, Jesus, our Lord, Jesus, our God, still bears today in his body the scars of his humanity? If you're taking notes this morning, I want to preach three things of what Jesus' scars speak of. Point number one is this, Jesus' scars speak of God's love of humanity. See, I, I think uh, many of us in here have a scar. Anybody in here have a scar on your body, right? Maybe uh, from when you were playing, when you were young. I, for me, uh, I have a scar uh, right here on, on my arm. If I was to lift up my, my sweater, you could see it uh, from, from, from a fishing story growing up. 
And uh, I, I grew up and I, I had this friend, his name was Blake Chambers, and, and he lived two, two houses down from me. And uh, we loved to fish. So about, we were like eight or nine and Blake would come to church and, and whatever it was this Sunday, after the first service, I go to my dad. I'm like, dad, hey, can I, can, can I go home with Blake a little early and let's go fishing? And, and normally, my, my dad does not allow uh, us to skip church like that. He's like, you're here all day. Uh, you went to church, and then you served in another service. That was kind of the flow. But for whatever reason, this day, he, he allowed me to go home with Blake. And so... Uh, we're going and, and we're going to go fishing and we've got this little pond down by our house. We hop on our bikes, take our fishing poles. And, and at this time, the, the lake that we fished, uh, th there was, uh, we fished from the bank. We didn't have a boat. We were eight or nine, right? And about six feet back from where you would fish, there was a bunch of bushes and trees. And, and so we'd take our lure, we'd throw it out. But what would happen a lot of times is we would take our lure and sometimes you get caught in the bush or the tree and then we'd have to yank it out. Now, we're eight or nine years old. We aren't uh, being real careful and going over and, and just carefully plucking out the lure. Now, we're, we're like, it gets stuck, we yank it and just say, if the pole breaks, daddy will buy a new one. You know what I mean? So we're just like, we're yanking it. And this was just common practice for us as young boys. And uh, one day, I'm fishing about maybe five or six feet right of Blake and he's to my left and I got a little too close to him and he winds back and he thinks that he got stuck in the branches behind us but instead I look down and I see a lure just resting carefully on my arm and I look down and it was just resting there I said, oh wait Blake and he didn't hear me soon enough and he goes Whoop! And I can see it as plain as day, that lure, the two of the three trebles just going right in my arm and going, oh, you caught me. That day, Blake caught the biggest fish he'd ever catch. And we go to the hospital, you know, like, like this is why you don't skip out on church. My, my grandmother used to say, or my great-grandmother, my father's grandmother, she used to fish every day of the week except for Sundays because Sundays you catch devil fish. And so, undoubtedly, Blake caught a devil fish that day. And so we go, we go, we, we go to the, the hospital and in the emergency room, and my mom's there, and the doctor says, well, uh, never seen this before. Let me go out to my truck and grab my pliers. And we laughed. Like, we're like, that's funny. He's going to go to his truck and grab his pliers. Sure enough, he comes back in with some pretty rusty pliers and proceeds to take the hook out. But you know what's wild? Did that cause me to stop fishing? No. <laughs> the pain that I experienced did not cause me to stop fishing. Why? Because I love fishing. I went right back out the very next day, very next week, and went right back out of it. See, scars kind of remind us of something. But I want us to see that the scars that Jesus bears bear witness to his love for humanity, that the incarnation of Christ is a revelation of God's love for humanity. That, that, that Jesus leaving heaven to come and walk on earth as a man being born of the Virgin Mary is a revelation of God's love for you, of God's love for me, of God's love for humanity. And in theology, this is often called what's called a theophany, a revelation of who God is. And Jesus on the cross is not a condemnation of humanity, but is rather a revelation of God's love for humanity. And God taking on humanity in the life of Jesus is a revelation of God's love for us. God did not condemn humanity on the cross. Rather, God judged sin and showed his love for humanity on the cross. Anybody thankful today that God loved us enough to leave his throne in heaven to come and become a human and live a human life and go to the cross to show his love for us? See, but we gotta see this too, that God has attached himself to humanity to never be detached from humanity. 
that Jesus becoming human, God becoming human and entering into flesh was not something that he did for 30 years and then he rose from the dead and then threw off humanity. But Jesus loved us so much that he attached himself to humanity to never be detached. John Chapter 1, verse 1 and 14 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word became human and made His human among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. You see, Jesus is as much human as he is God. And Jesus is as much God as he is human. And the two cannot be separated from one another. That Jesus' humanity cannot be separated from who he is, just like Jesus' divinity cannot be separated from his humanity. And the, the truth is this, that, that, that this story shows us that, that Jesus will never be detached from humanity. He did not raise from the dead and throw off his humanity, but he still bears the scars in his body that, that speak of his humanity. And when we think of humanity, we think of it as something to just throw off, to, to, to get out of, that, 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 that we, we need to die so that we can leave these bodies behind. That we need to die so that we can just be spirits. And, and, and this, this true uh, uh, eternal state is a spiritual state to leave our bodies behind. But Jesus shows us that at the resurrection, that there's a glorified body that you and I are going to inherit. That our bodies are not something to leave behind. But Jesus actually steps into humanity. Showing humanity is not something for us to escape, but humanity is something that Jesus has redeemed. See, we think of humanity as something that we got to get away from. But we serve the God that did not escape humanity. Rather, he stepped into it. And the incarnation, when we understand it, it is a defeat of all escapist theology that says, I just can't wait to get out of this body and out of this life. And Jesus' scars show that God is not distant from our pain and brokenness, but rather Jesus has joined us in our suffering. Jesus has joined us in our suffering, and Jesus shows Thomas that He did not desert Thomas. Rather, he had joined Thomas in his suffering. And I've come to tell you today, Jesus has not deserted you, has not forgotten about you. Jesus has not looked over you. Jesus has actually stepped into your suffering, stepped into humanity, joined himself to us as the great one that that intercedes for us and knows our great weakness. So when you're suffering, remember, God has not forgotten about you, but rather, God has joined himself to you in suffering. So Jesus' scars, they speak of not only God's love for humanity, but they speak of humanity healed. Now I've got... A scar on my arm, but I also have an even uh, more visible scar right here on my pinky finger. And uh, believe it or not, it comes from the same young man, Blake Chambers, right here on my pinky finger. Listen, I haven't talked to Blake in 15 years, but I think and remember Blake very well. For whatever reason, my mom and dad just kept thinking, this is a great, great guy for you to hang out with. You keep getting hurt. And, and one day, we were out in our yard doing what all uh, young boys like to do, which is uh, play uh, cops and robbers. And so we had our, our uh, 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 water guns and 
Uh, we'd start with these little like water pistols and we'd shoot each other, see, see who could get more wet. And then it seemed as time went on that we actually had to kind of one up the next guy. And so, you know, he had his water pistols and I would go in and get a little, little bazooka gun and then he'd come out with like a big torpedo thing that would spray all this. And then we said, I'm not going to be outdone again. And one of us went and got the water hose. Come on, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the chump of them all. You just get the water hose and you don't get much better than that. And so we're doing this. We're yanking it from one another. And sure enough, he's captured the water hose and he's captured it. And uh, I'm behind. I'm like, all right, I'm going to sneak up. I'm going to grab uh, the water hose from him. And it was one of those old school ones. You know, it, had a, it was metal. Remember these little metal ones? And uh, I went up to grab the water hose from behind him, and he went like this. And sure enough, it clamped right down on my finger real good. And that water hose on the underneath, the, the, uh, the, the metal part, is a little sharp. And it just like ripped my pinky in two. And it hurt. And I look at it. And I still see the scar. And the scar reminds me of two things. The scar speaks that my finger is no longer injured, but it's healed. That I, I, I can look here and I can see that there once was pain right there. There once was a moment where I, 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 I felt pain and was wondering, do I need stitches? But the scar speaks that it's no longer injured, but that it is healed. And the scars of Jesus speak that humanity is no longer broken, but humanity is healed. See, Jesus healed in his humanity what humanity could not heal in itself. And when Jesus shows Thomas the scars in his hand, he is saying, Thomas, I did for you what you could not do for yourself. Thomas, I, I, I made a way where you could not make a way. The scars speak that what was ailing your body, what was ailing your life, the sin that you carried, the scars, the scars speak that your life has been healed. See, Jesus became human to heal what we could not heal ourselves. But the, the second thing that the scar kind of reminds me of is the scar on my finger also reminds me of what I've been healed from. I can go back, look at this scar, and go back to the moment that it happened. Yeah. It's amazing. A scar kind of like implants something into your mind and implants an event. A, you can like go right back there. You can go right back to the moment that it happened. And by simply looking at the scar, I'm reminded of the pain and the moment I experienced. And the scars of Jesus are a reminder of what humanity has been healed from. They remind us that, that we're not broken any longer, but it also reminds us of what we've been healed from. That humanity's been healed from hate. We've been healed from injustice, from sin. Violence means that we no longer have to continue down the same patterns that we used to do. We don't have to live as humans in the cycles of hate and injustice and violence and sin any longer. Because the scars of Christ testify to Christ's victory over the things we could not get victory over. I'm thankful that Jesus got the victory for me when I could not get the victory for myself. And the scars of Jesus proclaim that humanity's healed. The scars of Jesus proclaim that in his body he bears humanity's healing. And Jesus stands forever in perpetuity as the God that became man to never be divided from humanity, proclaiming that through his scars, the healing of humanity. St. Gregory said this, that which Jesus has not assumed, he has not healed. If he cannot represent us, then he cannot redeem us. But I think in 
our modern evangelical way, we have created an image of Jesus that is distant from who the Bible says he is, from what orthodoxy says he is. And we've created an image, if you will, of Jesus in our image instead of an image of him being presented to us here in John chapter 20. See, what is it that you need healing from? Because Jesus bears the scars that speak to the healing you need. That Jesus bears in his body the scars that speak of your healing. So what do you need healing from? Just touch the scars of Jesus. Like Thomas touched the scars of Jesus and said, Oh Lord, my God, we too have been invited into knowing that Jesus has not distanced himself from humanity, but Jesus has entered into our pain and into our suffering, and he has healed what we could not heal ourselves. Touch the scars of the forever scarred God because God's scars speak that the brokenness of your humanity, of my humanity, has been healed. And in Genesis 4, we see that Cain is cursed. He murders Abel, he's cursed to be a restless wanderer. And, and Cain bears a mark on his body as a sign to people that would come and, and try, to, try, try, to, try to kill him. But I want us to see this, that Cain bore a mark that spoke to humanity's brokenness while Jesus bears the scars that speak of humanity's healing. That what Adam started, what Cain continued Jesus healed the scars of Jesus speak of humanity's healing Thomas Aquinas said this it was fitting for Christ's soul at his resurrection to resume the body with its scars that Jesus would wear the scars as an everlasting trophy of his victory. See, the scars of Jesus are a trophy that stays with him forever. The scars of Jesus are a trophy that he's triumphed over death. The scars of Jesus are a trophy that, that death could not hold him. Are, are, they're, they're, they're a trophy that he's already defeated sin. He's defeated uh, uh, whatever it is that we are facing. And Jesus' scars, they speak of number three, weakness turned to strength. See, we don't like the idea of God having scars because we see scars as weakness. In fact, uh, just by the title this morning of the forever scarred God, some people's walls just automatically went up because you could never imagine God with scars because we say scars represent a place of weakness. But I want you to see this, that scars do not speak of weakness. Rather, scars are proof of resurrection power in the midst of suffering. Scars do not represent or speak simply of weakness, but they're proof that resurrection power has come into suffering and redefined what weakness is. That weakness has been turned into strength. St. Augustine imagined this. He said, perhaps in the kingdom of God, we're going to see on the bodies of the martyrs the traces of the wounds that they bore for Christ's name. Because it will not be a deformity, but a dignity in them. And a certain kind of beauty will shine in them and in their body. You see, in our context, we want to hide our scars. I'm wearing a sweater today covering up a scar that I have. 
But, but for St. Augustine, he's saying perhaps the scars that we carry into the next life after the resurrection and into everlasting life are not going to be something that we hide, but are actually going to tell the beautiful story of what God has redeemed. That perhaps our scars are not something for us to hide behind, but are actually meant to be a testimony and proof that there is resurrection power in the midst of suffering. That Jesus chose not to hide his scars, but showed them to Thomas as a testament of what he had healed in Thomas' life. What he had healed in our humanity. You see, when when God becomes human, it's not humanity that changes God. But rather, when God becomes human, it's God that changes humanity. That that, that when Jesus steps into the human frame, that he gives new possibilities that were never possible in our sin nature because Jesus is not born from the seed of Adam in a sin nature, but he's born of a virgin from Mary by the seed of the Holy Spirit without a sin nature, redefining and reframing what is then possible for humanity. You see, nothing simply happens to Jesus. Jesus happens to everything else. But when Jesus becomes weak, it is not that God becomes powerless, but rather it is weakness that becomes strength. But we want to run away from our weakness. We want to run away from our shortcoming when Jesus has redefined Weakness into strength. See, Jesus, by stepping into weakness, redefines weakness as strength. This isn't a common, or this this isn't a, a, a new idea of us trying to escape our weakness. In fact, the Apostle Paul struggled with it so often. We're told in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time Jesus said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. See, Jesus redefines weakness as strength. But we are stuck in the same mindset for how the world defines weakness. And so we run away from our weakness. Rather, Jesus has invited us to lean into our weakness that his strength might be made known in our life, through our life. See, Jesus shows us that humanity will bear the scars of the first Adam beyond this life to testify of the second Adam's victory. Jesus has a glorified body. He's resurrected. He's yet to ascend to the Father. And he's in his glorified body and he still bears the scars of his humanity. See, I think sometimes we're just trying to get out of our brokenness and our humanity that we, we go, you know, when I leave this world, I'm just going to leave all the scars of my first life behind. But Jesus shows us that even when Jesus comes again and we get our glorified bodies, And there's a new heaven and a new earth that we will still bear the scars of our first life and the second. Well, why? Because Jesus has chosen to heal humanity forever. He's chosen not to do away with us. He's chosen not to say, I'm going to create some new humans and but he's redeemed us. And it's because God has redefined weakness to strength 
God has said our scars are meant to be a testimony of what we've been healed from. And God desires in the new heavens and the new earth for us to continue to bear the scars of past trauma that we've experienced in this life as a testimony of the healing power of Jesus. But I think for some of us, if we're honest, we've yet to allow the grace of our Lord to meet us in an open wound. And many of us have been carrying the same hurt years and years and decades and decades. And the wound is still open and we don't quite have a scar yet. That the wound is still open. But Christ invites us into a place where resurrection power meets suffering, death, and wound and works in the midst of that situation that heals it and bears a scar of testimony to what Jesus has done. When we're healed from past trauma or pain, we bear the scars of the first Adam that testify to the life of the second Adam, Jesus. We bear the scars of Christ when we move from pain into his promise, from sorrow into his joy, but we move out of our brokenness into a life of wholeness. And as we're in the Lent season, we approach Good Friday, we approach Easter, we approach this. I want us to make sure and remember who Jesus is, that the face of Jesus is the face of the forever scarred God. That he's met us in our suffering that he's chosen not to throw off humanity as a garment, but that he's chosen to heal what we could not heal. The face of Jesus is the face of the forever scarred God. We pray this morning, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you did not think of us as something unworthy, but Lord, you loved the world so much that you gave your life for us. That while we were still sinners living in our sin, you died for us, Lord. You came, Lord. Lord, I pray right now God, for any person that is still bearing open wounds, God, I pray today that this message will speak that you have invited us in to healing. God, that we will no longer walk around bleeding on other people, but Lord, we will allow you to heal the wounds in our life so that we can show the scars of our healing as a testimony to you, Lord. Maybe you're in this room this morning and, and you're going, man, I, 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 ha- I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to I ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I've, I've lived too long in my sin and I want to come out of my sin and out of darkness and out of trauma and out of my wounds of my past. And you say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Or maybe you want to say, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus on the count of three. What I want you to do, I want you to lift your hand and I want you to say, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life, my Lord and my Savior. One, go ahead and lift up your hand. Two, three, I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you, Lord. I see that hand. I see that all across this room. Lord, we say, God, we don't want to stay in our brokenness any longer, but Lord, we want to enter into life everlasting. God, we want to leave brokenness and step into wholeness. So Lord, meet us here. Lord, meet us in our pain. Meet us in our brokenness. 
meet us in our suffering. Can we stand together, church? And as we stand, can we declare this out? Can we just declare that He is the same God that loves us, that cares for us? Come on and declare this today. Come on, say, you heard your children. 